to the first little webinar that we're trying out at Levy Group. Uh, this morning we have with us um, Dustin Stevenson from DPIRD and Claire Johnston from uh, Local Elders Branch. We're just having a quick chat this morning about um, budworm and DBM and yeah, pests around the area. So I will head over, um, hand over to Dusty to have a quick chat to everybody. Well, thanks, Katrina. I'll just see if I can share the screen. Where are we? Or as you can see that. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, been asked to talk about um, native budworm uh, and diamondback moth, two, two of our major pests. And um, at the end, I'll just um, provide a bit of an update on what's going on with fall armyworm and Russian weed aphid. Um, but yeah, in terms of native budworm, it's been an absolutely massive year for us, especially in the northern and central um, egg regions, but especially the north. Um, when we started finding caterpillars uh, in the green bridge and identifying them then as native budworm, we kind of thought already we're, we're in for an interesting year and a bit out of the ordinary. Uh, but we also had really high uh, rainfall in some of these northeastern pastoral areas in February with those cyclonic um, weather patterns. And whenever that happens, we also know that it's potentially a big budworm year. Uh, because that's where they, being a native moth, they live out, out there and um, they migrate seasonally. And that migration just happens to coincide with um, susceptible uh, crops being around, um, being especially pulses, but also canola. What's going on here? Oops, sorry about that. Um, so, Getting a bit of a heads up, thinking it's gonna be a really bad year. We actually set up our, our pheromone moth trapping network um, a month early. We usually only start at the beginning of August and often we just get zeros across the board. Uh, and then we try and track you know, where they're flying in, um, typically hitting um, north of Geraldton there and east of Geraldton usually first, but we found straight away the moth traps were filling up um, with really high numbers. So we had a pretty good indication that um, this was gonna be a, a very high pressure year. So high, high numbers of moths flying in, but also the fact that they came in early means that they're really coinciding with um, earlier growth stages as well, which we've seen, unfortunately, this is sort of the third year in a row, we've seen very high pressure of budworm um, and you know, in unsprayed crops, we're seeing defoliation of plants um, and also um, damage to buds and flowers in, in, in worst case scenarios, just completely stripping crops. Um, so it's a numbers game that, um, in terms of the damage, but also the fact that they came in early, it's a bit of a worry. So you can see also in the center leg as well, and then um, Esperance was getting hit, which doesn't happen every year. They can often um, can happen earlier or later for that region. Um, and then the, the, last, the last two weeks of July, you can see that those numbers are pretty well maintained. They haven't really flown in um, far into the great southern and um, Albany port zone, but numbers are really, so what I would call moderate numbers, I suppose, being maintained in the northern, central, um, and Esperance region and picking up a bit more in the central. And then the first couple of weeks of August, we see um, numbers being maintained as well, pretty moderate numbers at this stage and even through to getting towards the end of July, we're already seeing that those uh, eggs that were laid in crops um, are really actually starting to get picked up much earlier than usual um, because they laid eggs much earlier. Um, and so, yeah, first two weeks of August there, um, still moderate numbers there. Um, and then we see numbers are really dropping off in the last couple of weeks of August and then more so, um, Lately, uh, we're getting traps with zeros as well. So it's interesting that the numbers are, 
are really tapering off, but we are um, wondering if this is maybe there's maybe going to be another wave coming as as what as often happens during this time of year, and if that happens, whether that poses a risk in that sort of window that we've got left for pulses in canola, um, and also unfortunately the with the high pressure um, of moths, uh, we're also seeing it a lot in um, cereal crops, particularly wheat, and that I guess that even started. Um, late July as well, uh, that we were started hearing about damage in cereals, it's, which is unfortunate. Um, we, we know that some, to some extent that's affiliated with uh, where we're seeing high numbers in, uh, in wheat, in, in, in sweep nets, sort of even above 40 in 10 sweeps. It's often affiliated with um, wild radish, which is a host, so moths will come in and lay eggs on that. Caterpillars will emerge, and then if that's um, sprayed out, those caterpillars crawl onto the wheat and then are sort of forced to have a nibble. But see, the fact that cereals are not a recognized host of native budworm um, is quite interesting. And um, we, we have certainly confirmed that that is the species that we're dealing with, with the, with the caterpillars that we're seeing, because there is a lesser budworm. Um, and maybe some, some cases that is lesser budworm, uh, which will attack cereals and doesn't really like pulses in canola. Um, so there is that species out there, but every time we've um, chased up, it has been Helicoverpa punctigera. If, um, but if you can get a hand lens on the caterpillars and if you see white hairs along the body instead of black hairs, um, you're likely to have lesser budworm, which is real. You're looking at a risk there because they, it is a host. Um, whereas, um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's an interesting scenario, and we've certainly flagged it with GRDC and others that. Um, being the third year in a row of damage in cereals, we really need to get on top of this, look at thresholds and, and this sort of thing. Um, is it something we need to be worried about now in the future? Um, or can we actually work out that it's not doing much damage at all? Uh, and I'll just talk a little bit about the, the thresholds that we do use. If you look at the, the blue um, K in this equation here of how it's sort of, um, the threshold's been developed is uh, the department did quite a lot of work on um, just looking at how much damage budworm do to the different pulse and canola crops. And that's really what the threshold's based on is um, kilos per hectare eaten for every uh, one caterpillar uh, in 10 sweeps or also in the case of lupins, you'll see we've got a sweep net threshold and also a per square meter threshold. And so that varies, but then we can also throw in the the control costs and the anticipated um, grain price. So it's a little bit dynamic in that sense, which is good. Um, but you can see that it does vary quite a lot. Budworm really, really uh, love field peas and faba beans. So you can see that the loss um, for each grub in 10 sweeps is the highest um, and certainly in uh, lentils. But then if you look at um, probably more relevant chickpeas, lupins and canola that starts really dropping, um, particularly in, in lupins and canola is interesting. Uh, and that damage usually tends to only happen later in the season when the pods are maturing and the, the caterpillars can um, get through that uh, sort of unfavored green pod wall um, that they don't really like until it starts ripening. But with such high pressure, we're seeing uh, budworm caterpillars burrow into green pots. They don't really seem to be bothered um, in these scenarios, so that's a bit of a worry as well. Uh, there's certainly a uh, scope to be able to to use thresholds, um, see what you know what's economically viable to jump the gun, or can can we hold off and get away with one spray, which will be quite interesting in this year to see whether we can get away with one spray or not, um, as the window is is um, open. Um, and so with that threshold calculator, you can, you can see just with lupins as an example um, and the lupin grain price at the bottom and the, the budworm in 10 sweeps on the y-axis, you can see there's not a huge difference with, with lupins at least, um, but if you, you can see how the thresholds shift um, going from you know, $300 uh, dollars a ton, you're looking at about five and 10 sweeps, getting down to um, 
if it went up to $500 a ton, you're looking at three. So there's not a huge difference here, but um, it's just uh, something we can use. It varies a little bit more with the other um, crop types. And moving on to diamondback moth, our major pest of uh, spring canola. We have a GRDC project on this, um, which Libby Group are a part of as well, which is great. Um, a lot of grower groups on board with this um, project and uh, Deep Herd staff doing some of it uh, and some agronomists as well. Um, so we've got these, um, we've already done the Greenbridge surveillance and, and we've looked at what sort of brassica species are in the green bridge, which is quite interesting. Um, we'd expect things like wild radish and wild turnip, and that's certainly the majority of what we found was wild radish. Um, but we also found um, other brassicas in the environment that was hosting diamondback moth. Um, one actually uh, that we had a bit of a tip off from Sardi in South Australia was sea rocket, which is a dune plant. So diamondback moths are surviving summer on, on some of this dune vegetation as well. Um, but in terms of the uh, focus paddocks, you can see we've got dotted around the grain belt. What we wanted to do was see, well, where they are in the green bridge. Let's, let's look at some of these crops that are near and also far from green bridge and see whether there's any sort of link. But, it, but also on its own, it, it, it's interesting just to see the dynamics of diamondback moth and how they change over time. But um, fortunately, things have been really, uh, or numbers, I should say, have been really, really low or, or in a lot of cases non-existent through these, through all, all five port zones, which is good and kind of only really picked up very recently, you can see in the last couple of weeks of August, um, really low numbers in the northern and central areas, but they have been trickling through the, you know, trickling around through the crops. They hadn't really, they, they do tend to be around in winter. They don't tend to explode. Um, so the environmental conditions of, you know, warm spring spring temperatures has a big impact. We're just trying to see what's going on there, but you can see that uh, the Esperance zone has increased quite a lot lately. Um, so this is the moths which are caught on pheromone traps, which specifically catch the male moths of that species. But what's really important as well to follow up what's going on with the moths with the caterpillars. And so you can see, uh, fortunately in the Northern and Central, in most cases, we're looking at no larvae being detected in the last couple of weeks of August, August being a quite a critical month. Um, we sort of think that if, if we can detect the caterpillars in August, the risk is higher than if we don't detect them in August. Um, so if they're, if they're present in August, they're, they're definitely reproducing and potentially um, going to reproduce fast as they hit spring, warm spring days. But generally, the, the moth numbers sort of match the larvae where esperance is sort of increasing there. Um, and sorry, I thought I had another map there, but uh, and just, just lately over the last week as well, they've increased a bit more um, through esperance, but really low numbers where we are, apart from a few. And that's kind of typical, I suppose, with diamondback moth, where they'll, they'll sort of kick off in very, very localized regions. And then we might see that expand, um, or or we we may not. So it's important. That's why it's important to monitor um, to see whether spraying um, is necessary. But in terms of the thresholds for diamondback moth, they're um, they're not really affiliated with grain price in that. So it'd be good to have a little bit more of a dy dynamic threshold um, to see what's economically viable, especially with I think with stressed crops in spring, it would be good to have more options for that. Um, but as you can see, generally, we've only really seen that well, this, a stressed pre-flowering crop um, would have 30 intense sweeps. But you can see as, as the growth stage increases, many more uh, caterpillars and tent sweeps are required before it's feasible to spray. And there, well, there's a disclaimer there, moisture stress not listed for these growth stages. Um, so yeah, you might have to uh, also drop those, but yeah, it would be good for this to be revised, I think, it, particularly because it's a bit of a frustrating pest. It's not, not altogether cheap as well, especially if a double spray um, is required to break that life cycle. 
And I just wanted to give an update on fall armyworm as well. It's, uh, we still, in, in terms of the grain belt of WA at least, still have just the one moth detected near Geraldton. And we have over 70 uh, fall armyworm pheromone traps set up around the grain belt. And they're all zeros across the board still, which is, uh, which is good news, I think. But being a migratory species, we, we still don't really know what's gonna happen. Um, there's certainly uh, in, in, in Carnarvon and, and um, causing damage to crops there. So they're not far away, but they haven't really migrated in. So yeah, we're hoping that, that they don't. But looking at some of the, uh, the features here, I think it's important to point out, especially in relation to budworm, um, especially budworm being found in cereals, because we suspect even though fall armyworm will attack pulses, canola, and cereals, we think it might be, uh, cereals might be a little bit more at risk. Um, it certainly uh, loves uh, maize and Rhodes grass, so it's, it's possible, but we, we put these um, physical features out for people to identify. Um, but it's important, I think, in terms of budworm, when we look at the dots on the back in this trapezius um, arrangement and these four dots as in squares, the problem with that, especially if the caterpillars aren't full grown and they're, they're smaller, you can see that it is a bit similar to budworm where we have the dots in that pattern and um, there's a bit more of a hump at the back, which isn't always really easy to see, but I think there can be confusion there. And also the, this pale stripe, so they're saying on the back, um, I mean, there's, there's stripes along budworm as well. So I think, I think what's probably most important is being an army worm, if you look at right behind the head capsule, there's, there's quite a clear collar, or we call it a collar, um, often has these stripes on it. All our, all our common army worms, which attack cereals, have this as well. So it's, I think it's important to look for this distinct collar and also this really, really pronounced V, upside down V on the head, which goes to the top, top of the head, whereas budworm has a little bit, but the, it's, it's really not pronounced. And the collar here isn't, isn't actually a collar. So um, I think that's probably the best way of identifying it. If you're sweep netting crops, having a look, and you see something that doesn't really fit what, what looks like budworm here, um, and they can change color really dramatically as well, which is a, um, a bit confusing. Budworm can be very green and not, not many features, or they can be really dark like this one. And in terms of cereal aphids, you'd be familiar with the corn and oat aphids, which we do have. So we're doing quite a bit of surveillance at the moment to see um, where Russian wheat aphid is and isn't. Um, but corn aphid, you can see has what what we call these exhaust pipes or siphuncles at the back. Um, they're pretty pronounced. You might need a hand lens for it, but you can see that they're definitely there. Um, and the body is a bit sort of has ridges along it. Um, usually not so pronounced um, sometimes, but usually you can, you can be able to pick that up. And they're sort of dark patches. Whereas the oat aphid, which you're more likely to see has rusty, rusty red patches. Um, oat aphids can be sort of this color through to really, really black. Um, so they, they, yeah, they change color a lot, but again, you'll see these siphuncles or exhaust pipes out the back. The easiest way to tell whether you've got Russian wheat aphid is that they are not there, but they have these two tiny little tails out the back. Uh, so, and they're, they're a bit more tapered at the back. So fortunately we can identify Russian wheat aphid pretty easily compared to the oat and corn aphids, but the uh, fall armyworm, it's a little bit more confusing, I think. And in some cases we need the specimen to put under a microscope to, uh, to be sure about that. Uh, and, and the, the department um, with researchers uh, from, from, from Kandanara, they've done some research that, that, that saw that there was um, group one resistance in their populations of fall armyworm to uh, yeah, carbamates and organophosphates. So that's a bit of a worry if we're looking at insecticide resistance in a pest that we've only just got. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on that, I think. Fortunately with Russian wheat aphid, um, we have quite a few options when that spreads throughout the grain belt and generally it's been fairly manageable. Apart from um, the fact that it injects a toxin, 
um, into cereals. So they're, that can cause stunting early. Um, we don't really know, I guess, what sort of impact it's gonna have in WA, but judging from what's happened in South Australia, uh, we're sort of going on what they've done and how they've managed it. Um, so we're, I think it's something that we'll manage um, pretty well. And that's, uh, that's all I have on there. Um, if you like, I can, uh, I'll just share my screen again, just to point out. Where are we? Sorry. Sorry, this isn't working very well for me. Here we go. Um, so we've updated the winter spring chart to reflect um, Russian wheat aphid. I just wanted to point out um, that it does vary a little bit compared to the options we have for cereal aphids already. Uh, the SP is typically being a little bit more of an anti-feed. You say barley allodroid virus only, but um, there are options here, uh, as you can see. But in terms of Russian wheat aphids, so we've updated this if you want to get it off the department website for um, what's either registered or, or what's got what we've got permits for. We've got sulfoxiflor here, perimicarb, uh, lambda sialithrin, and chlorpyrifos. So we do have options here. Um, and I guess depending on what, what else is going on in the paddock or what we're likely to get, um, we'll have to sort of, I guess, look at that as well. Um, for example, perimicarb being an aphid specific compound, we've heard that that's doing quite a good job um, over east and can have a fumigate, fumigate effect, effect as well, which could help when they're a bit um, tucked away and hiding and that sort of thing and curling leaves or whatever. But being aphid specific, you're not going to you're not going to control any caterpillars with that. Um, so just just something to note uh, in terms of options we've got for that. All right. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Dusty. Um, so Claire, just over to you. If you had any comments uh, around management or anything you've seen locally. Um, yeah, I think mostly people are monitoring at the moment. Um, DBM in particular, we're sort of seeing between zero to 15 uh, per 10 sweeps. So something to continue monitoring, particularly as the weather warms up and their, um, yeah, I think their reproduction cycle speeds up considerably when that happens. So um, we're probably not quite out of the woods yet. Um, but something to monitor at, at current levels. Um, for budworm, have yeah, I'd say majority of pulse crops have already been sprayed, uh, and many lupin, uh, sorry, canola paddocks are being monitored. So um, continue to do that. The numbers do vary. Uh, so yeah, sweep a few different spots in those paddocks to just make sure that you are capturing the real picture. Um, yeah, and yeah, other than that, I think uh, growers, yeah, know how to control it. Um, it's more a case of, yeah, making sure they're at that threshold so you're not wasting that extra insecticide hit uh, and the cost uh, currently. It's all really uh, advanced, so most are wanting to do it via the plane, which has a, an extra cost, but yeah, you're not damaging your crops. So um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing issue for the moment, but we're not too far from it being nearly over. So continue monitoring for a few more weeks. Fantastic, thanks, Claire. Um, was there any other comments, Dusty? Um, just for you, Claire, like, uh, so with, with regards to budworm, you know, you said there typically had been high impulses and a lot of that has been sprayed. Um, but not a lot in, in canola? No, numbers have been in a loop and crop, say you'll see 40, and the mm. canola paddock right next door might be two. So um, at those numbers this year, we've just been monitoring. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's chalk and cheese 
so far this year, which yeah, last year we weren't seeing. It was all needing um, to be sprayed straight away. So, mm. yeah, I don't know if that's seems unusual. Really from... Seems strange that there's even more, I'm hearing more so in wheat than canola. Seems such, like such a strange thing. Yes, yeah, well, we have been seeing um, random areas of budworm in cereals um, earlier on, particularly on pulse stubbles. Uh, so, yeah, we are finding significant damage up to 40 grubs in, in cereals earlier, so that was a bit of a no-brainer with the damage that they were doing. And, yeah, still last week on wheat that was wheat stubble, uh, we were still finding around that that five mark, which a bit harder to see the damage. So something to continue monitoring there. Um, but yeah, unusual that that's higher than canola, which is a, a proper host, I guess. So yeah, quite an unusual couple of years for the budworm. Yeah, that's right. Mm, yeah, and, and Katrina, it's certainly like if um if there are um, growers in your group that are having ongoing issues with budworm and cereals, we'd be really interested to go and collect some um, to see whether they are that species or whether they're lesser budworm. Yep, definitely. No worries. We'll, we'll send out that message and <laughs> see how we go with that. No worries. All righty. Well, um, we might leave it at that. Thanks so much for your time this morning, right and early. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. We'll um, catch up a bit later on. Cool. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. See ya.